Uh, Michelin acquired uh, PTG, started right at the end of 2017. Technically, it was 2018 when they took full ownership. So uh, PTG now is a fully owned uh, part of uh, Group Michelin. And uh, still a great, great company to work with. I've enjoyed these guys a ton. Um, and, uh, and you guys can see we've got a lot of existing air supplies if they're on there. That's a lot more common in Europe uh, where they have air brakes on everything, a lot less common here in the US, but we can accommodate both ways if it's uh, existing air supplies or if we need to give an air supply, like we have on this tractor here that has a, a 35 CFM uh, hydraulically powered screw compressor and a very, very powerful compressor that's very smooth and uh, designed to work with uh, the brake systems as well. So if uh, there's ever concern about, geez, you're, I've got a, an air system on my machine, but it's for brakes. Uh, we've been designing for that since day one. So we understand the, the safety tap in and everything so that we're not uh, taking away from the performance of the brakes. And as you can see here, it's uh, really helping to drive the overall development of our future ag tires. So I like to tell folks, uh, as I look at this, think of it as a mobility solution, right? Um, sometimes we just get focused on one component or the tire or something like that. It's really the, the uh, whole mobility system of the machine. Uh, Ken Broadbeck, who's right back here, Ken waved to everybody. Ken is our, our distributor for the United States. He's with Precision Inflation, and he had some pretty interesting uh, stuff that I stole from one of his presentations to use in mine. But it shows some of the benefits that they've seen from being able to basically go to lower pressure in the field, higher pressure on the road. And that's what we're after here, because there's needs for both of those. 6% uh, better yield. Uh, in the field, that's the big one. That's the big money maker uh, for guys uh, due to reduced compaction, um, better fuel economy, both in the road and on the field, uh, a lot more tractive effort or power to the ground because we're reducing that slip. We're getting more, more use out of that, uh, that size tractor. And then a lot longer tire life. Uh, any of you guys that rode a bunch, I'll keep hammering this. It's in bold down here. And I tell guys this over and over again, this investment in this technology a lot of sense if you're roading a lot, right? Because now we really start needing two fully separate pressure settings um, for what we're trying to do versus trying to get away with one. Primary uh, message, as you guys can see, I can't stress it enough, big shifts in weight and speed, lots of roading. So when we think applications, this is one of the number one, right? Anytime we're hauling any uh, type of front fold planter, hauling manure is the other big one, high clearance sprayers or your floaters. Uh, those encapsulate when you think about what they're doing you can as a tire guy we can sit down and math that out when we look at your uh, what you need on the road and what you need in the field uh, it really starts to uh, show the value of this very quickly I also stole this from Ken because it's a great visual it's when we start talking about how do you reduce fuel consumption well every four tenths of an inch of uh, depth and rutting burns 10 percent more fuel so you start uh, multiplying that over the length of all your fields and you think about what that rutting looks like it, it starts turning into a lot of uh, a lot of additional fuel burn maybe not so big last year or two years ago but as fuel prices go up it's a lot more guys are getting very cost sensitive on the uh, on the fuel demands and i like to point this out because yes vf and if technology does it let you go to a singular lower pressure and work on the road absolutely i won't argue with that um, they will, the casing will uh, tolerate that heat that builds up. However, um, you are still going to see uh, irregular wear that comes out if you do a lot of roading, uh, a lot of roading at all, that lower pressure is still gonna lead to irregular wear uh, on those tires. Uh, you simply cannot do everything at one pressure optimally. Uh, these were some uh, cool pictures. Uh, this one actually Ken has a big blow up of over at our table. But a lot of guys will say it's all about the, the weight that's on a tire. And we'll argue to say, no, we really want to look at the, at the uh, pressure. Because you can see this, this picture was taken, I think, in Iowa, wasn't it, Ken? Right. Yep, in Iowa. This is from Europe, just showing some difference on the depth of the rut. Uh, but this one, I think, is even more impactful. So we look over here, you can see that tender at, at 1,000 pounds on that tire, because it was scaled, 73 PSI, rutted quite a bit, went over. And, and rutted well below the planter tire that was 3,500 pounds uh, for that tire, but at uh, 30 PSI. So 
you know, we want to get that number as low as possible in the field because we're trying to get closer to this and further away from that right there. And that comes from your pressure. And I point this out. I can't speak for every other rep here, but I can speak for Alex, uh, my colleague and the guy that takes care of all the tires here in Minnesota and the Dakotas. Uh, we have in the fine print on our data books that if you're doing roading over 50% of the time, add six PSI. Well, now you just spent, if you're a farmer that roads a lot, a whole bunch of money for lower pressure technology, but Michelin's telling you now add back all that air that you were able to take away because you're roading so much. And so again, it, it, it really allows, and this allows us to get the better roading and the better wear when we're on the road. And, and you're giving up some of that flotation in the field. So what makes up a Michelin PTG inflation system? It's a whole bunch of components. Uh, you guys can see most of them here. The parts that are hidden, we've got some examples sitting on the table there. But the big thing is the two-line rotary union system. Um, and as you look at all the different applications that we build, you will always see a larger feed line, if you will, and a small check valve line that runs to every one of our rotary unions. The thing I like to stress on our systems is when you look at some of our competition, and there's a, I'm excited when I see that Agco on their momentum planner is uh, promoting CTIS because I think the concept is critical and we got to get the, the message out there. Uh, they run a single line system. So that, that uh, think of it like old Christmas tree lights. If you pull a line out, that line's always under pressure you're gonna start losing air right away. On our system, the genius of the two-line system is, is the valves at the wheel are always closed unless we're adding or dumping air. And then we charge that, that check valve line, it opens the valve, and then we can move air in and out of the system. Otherwise, let's say you're out in the field, corn stalk gets in there and rips out the line. Doesn't matter, you can keep working. The tire is still sealed. We also use a separate hole. We drill a hole right into the wheel to uh, install the valve because we need a bigger aperture. We need a bigger hole so we can move more air in and out of that tire quicker, right? Because you're paying for time. And, and that allows us to do that. It also frees up that, uh, that traditional um, tire valve right there so that you can cross check it to see, you know, the monitor says I'm at 31 PSI, am I really? And you can go check that and, and they are. The system is massively precise. Uh, I typically find my experience has been over the past couple years, a half PSI equilibrium, say across an axle, or if it was um, uh, on a, a, a slurry tank or something like that, or on this, this machine right here, all six tires you'd still see within a half PSI equilibrium if we were adjusting all six of those. The compressors, very powerful, very quiet and smooth. I can't stress that enough. If you guys can imagine, you know, a lot of shops I go into, they have the uh, piston compressor running the running whatever your shop compressor you know how noisy that is and how much vibration that could cause uh, i we've we do have that option as a less expensive option for certain applications but the primary use for the the high uh cycle time stuff this unit included it's a screw compressor or a vein compressor incredibly powerful very smooth very quiet the only thing you really hear is your motor lug down because we are drawing on some hydraulic power to run those compressors uh, very reliable. So it's hydraulically driven? It is, yeah, it's hydraulically driven. So, and we can accommodate open center or uh, closed center systems. Either way, uh, we're, we're able to accommodate both. Is it powered beyond or something, or does it tie up and out with? Both. So if you look at this one, it's into the power beyond. We just teed into it. Uh, but uh, hey, if you've got a valve to spare, we can do that too. So but, then it decides when it runs? You would turn the system on and if, it, if you need to hit the button in the cab, say to increase pressure, then it will pull, pull oil and start running. So it has its own hydraulic requirement valve to shut itself off so you're planting all day? Well, you would, uh, we've got actually a switch in the cab where you just shut, shut down power to it. That way you're not constantly running that and pulling from the tractor. Question, yeah. It yeah. Yeah. Own valve. So. Um, this machine, because I was more interested in testing the system that's on the planner, uh, it has our traditional digital control box. Some guys like that, especially if maybe you got an older machine that doesn't have ISO, ISO bus, but where a lot of people want it is integrated right into the primary display. So we have ISO bus integration. And in fact, we're getting ready to come with a big software update on that, uh, at the end of this year. So a lot of development continuing into the side of the technology. 
A lot of safety. Uh, so mechanical electronic pressure limitation. Um, I have seen pictures, it wasn't our system, thank goodness, and I believe the farmer was good, uh, safe, which is the most critical thing where you hit the inflation, walk away from it, and unfortunately the system never stopped. And, and, and you can imagine the devastating uh, failure at that point when, when it hit the final limitation of the tire. So we have both mechanical uh, within the system and electronic uh, safety stops so that that doesn't happen. Uh, the, the Germans are highly co conscientious of the safety of the system itself. Uh, the part that I love, and you can see this, uh, it was convenient that we decided to mount it this way, is the ERV, electronic regulation valve. It's the one for the planter is actually sitting on the, uh, the tongue of the planter there. Um, but that is the electronic pneumatic proportional valve that's in there. That is what's really regulating everything. If we want to dump a lot of air quickly, that valve opens wide up, but we can monitor real time what that pressure is as it's running through there. And then that valve will start to close down as we get close to our final point that we want to achieve in the field. And uh, that way we don't overshoot it. And then you have an underinflated, right, over torque tire or just underinflated, overloaded tire in the field. So that allows us to get to that precision that we want. Because if you're running singular digit pressure, right, uh, your margin of error for where the pressure has to be is pretty small. So uh, we can do that with this system. And then all of our valves are engaged uh, from your primary controls in the cab. If you look at a lot of those single line systems, there'll be a little shutoff valve at every single wheel position. And if you don't close those at night, then you run the risk. If there's a leak in that system anywhere, you'll, you'll know because there'll be a flat tire in the morning. Uh, our system is not like that, that everything is done from the cab. Uh, the only exception, because I'll always talk about the asterisks, uh, the only exception is if you had an external feed and you wanted to get out to the field and disconnect the line just so you didn't risk pulling it out when you're running through, say, spraying and, and uh, standing crop or something like that, that'd be the only time you have to get out. Aside from that, everything is done from the cab. Real quickly, uh, RDS, it stands for a Rifle and Druck Regal System, so that's... Uh, our, our short, if you will, acronym for the internal system um, uh, or hidden system. Uh, this is what's on this tractor here. This would be a better shot of it if we didn't have the, the weights and everything in the way, but that's bolted right to the trumpet housing and that's our rotary union there. Um, you can see a little better picture of it there. It's on any bar axle. We can accommodate a variety of different bar axle sizes. We've got an example back here. Um, this would be for trailers that have rifle drilled axles and there's more and more of those coming. So if you look at spreaders and that type of thing down the road, large square balers would be another one, right? Anything where we've got an axle assembly, if we can rifle drill it, we can send air right through there. And then you can see it's an incredibly clean installation. There's really minimal of any lines anywhere. Of course, those can all be run from our uh, digital control box or our ISO bus. That's our actual interface. This is what's up in the cab of this tractor right there. It works, it's super reliable. We can handle three zones of pressure, right? So if we had front tire, rear tires, and the planter, there's a three different size tires, there's three different pressure zones. We can accommodate up to that with the, uh, with the box. This is what the primary screen looks like on the ISO bus, and, and we'll continue to uh, improve and give more flexibility and options with that some shots of our vein compressor. So we have in vein compressors, a 70 CFM or 140 CFM compressors. So I like to look at what is the need, right? So in this particular system, when we sized it and we looked at the volume of air and what was an acceptable time to move that air from the field pressure to the road pressure, uh, the way this thing is set up right now is approximately five minutes to go from the field to the road, right from the cab. Um, I mean, I guess if you were wanting to spend the money, you could go to 140 CFM. It would drop that down to a minute or two, but you almost start moving more air than some of the valves and lines can take uh, if it's into something small like these back here. But we have it. This is really going to be more for your large volume tires or multi-axle if we're into uh, manure applications or something to that effect. Um, or uh, big floaters. We have a 70 CFM one, a big floater to give you an idea. Uh, this is one of the John Deere four-wheeled floaters. And uh, I set the, Ken went and, and fired the system up. I put the uh, tire gauge on the valve stem and watched it in about every 10 seconds. Uh, we were going up over half PSI and that was inflating all four tires. So that 70 CFM is a tremendous amount of air that we were moving.
there's the machine that you see in the picture. So um, this was a big one. I, when I was hired for this position, they said, Sean, tell us what the market looks like. Said, okay, it was COVID, we weren't traveling anywhere. So I got to spend a lot of time doing market research. And uh, the two, my three big takeaways was that one, um, big shifts of weight and speed, lots of road, and we can justify, justify the investment. And then what were the applications where we had lots and lots of that and corn planting was one of them. So um, we went and looked at then what kind of machines were out there, what was being built and what could we currently accommodate versus what did we need to be able to accommodate. This is one of the most popular configurations that you see here, 24 row and 30 inch running what was an 11 R22.5 tire now. And, and I hate to admit this, but I'll admit it. We had to run a, a Firestone tire on this particular instance because Michelin doesn't have one quite yet. Uh, so it's a VF 295R75 R22.5, excuse me. Um, but if you look, that's, that's tight physically. There's not a lot of space in there, right? That's, that's, everything's very close. There's no way to uh, externally run air. So we had to come up with a way to run a rotary union within that tiny confines of physical space, and they did it. And I, I'm really excited to say the system you see back here planted at least 3,000 acres this year uh, and ran absolutely flawlessly. In fact, the only issue we had is uh, when the production systems come out this winter, uh, you'll see a different valve. You won't see this valve that's on these, uh, on the wheels here on this planter. You'll see something what we call a laydown valve that will have a 90 in it, be much closer to the wheel, and we'll have a big guard over it as well because you guys grow great rocks in Minnesota. Oh yeah. So as a testament to the, the two line or dual line design, uh, day one, hour one to two of, of this test that took months to get into place and everything, the farmer uh, got one of those fantastic rocks that you guys grow and it took out the top end of the valve. He didn't know it until the end of the day when he went to air the system back up to uh, head home and fortunately, when he saw the error message, he, uh, he was less than a mile from the house, so he just uh, limped at home slowly because we had the, uh, the field pressure in there. Uh, fixed it the next morning in the field in five minutes with a new valve, and he was back up and running no other issues. So we, we forgot one thing. We'll have that resolved by the time we have production. And uh, aside from that, it was a flawless system. You guys can see here, we, uh, we did a lot of work to make sure we scaled it exactly and knew what we had. 31,500 pounds on the back axle of the tractor, uh, 16,800 pounds uh, on those, those center four tires. Uh, he's uh, in the field at six, he's roading at 30. And uh, you know, we wanted to work with him to see you know, what kind of changes would we have. Um, it is the RDS system, both on the planter and on the tractor, we have the uh, 35 CFM compressor on there and uh, running the, the standard digital control box. If you haven't walked around and looked at it, which I'm excited that it's here and we can, this is what it looks like. So there's a spacer nut. If you look at, say, the wing wheels, you'll see that with a little set screw in there. Take that out. This rotor reunion goes right in in its place. The silver is the stator, the blue is the rotor. We do use that set screw to get everything set, uh, but everything goes right back together. It's a very quick installation. Uh, to put that on and then we run the lines the very first time we did it took a little more time now It'd be very easy to teach people how to run the lines and uh, Get everything hooked up because it's just plug-and-play from that point to get the lines fit and uh, and everything secured So I'll show you a bunch of pictures because we were also and this ran in Windham, Minnesota Just so you know, so this was just down the road from here. Not too awful far um uh, these guys uh, also um, have their own test plot and they have an agronomist on staff if you will so we wanted to run some comparisons this year to see hey you know everyone says that that pressure matters so what does it look like everything you're going to see on the left side is going to be the standard pressure or high pressure everything on the right is our ctis enabled field pressure and just so you know, we're cycling the back axle of the tractor from 30 PSI down to 14 PSI. And the planter mains are going from 61 down to 25. So big, big variance in pressure. You can just see this is day one when they planted, and these are right next to each other. Uh, standard pressure, which a lot of you guys see versus the low pressure. 
So then you remember it was dry for a while and we finally got a rain after I forget how many weeks. And this was the very first day it rained and you guys can see the water infiltration difference, right? So definitely a big difference there. Again, standard pressure, standard pressure, because this is where at best you're gonna get to. Maybe you could get the tractor to 24, 23 PSI if you invested in VF on the back axle of the tractor, but the planter is still gonna be at 61, which is an improvement from the 85 or 90 PSI that a lot of the truck tires that were on here before had to run, right? So it's still an improvement, but nowhere close to where we can get it to. And this is where it's really started to get it interesting. So the agronomist has gone out multiple, multiple times now and keeps checking it. High pressure, and you can see the green is emergence on day one, yellow is emergence on either day two or three. And, and now we're into a part that Sean Higgins is gonna make a disclaimer. I'm not an agronomist. But, but we got a real good one we're working with. And uh, she was explaining a lot of the differences and what that means for yield and everything. You can see the quote that uh, we had from her. The big takeaway for me was right down here at the bottom. The planting rate at this particular area was 32,500. The emergence rate on the standard pressure was at 20,000, on the low pressure was at 30,000. So those were the first quantitative numbers we got coming back to us. This was taken several, just a few weeks ago, about a month and a half ago now, I would say, uh, maybe two months ago, because I was in South Carolina the day she sent me these pictures. So here on the high pressure, you can see this is a control route, right? So we pulled something out of, I don't know, row 16 or row 17, whatever it was, uh, that they use for their control row. And this was a pinch row. And we're looking at root development. So compare that to the low pressure, same comparison. It was, it was dramatic. It was dramatic. And uh, I haven't been out to this stand, but uh, I do understand that we're, we're seeing a, a lot of even, you know, I've had guys tell me they want to get rid of that wave that's out there in the field. And, and we're seeing that so far. There's one other, before I discuss this, just real quick, there is one other, I don't have it up here because we didn't have a big enough sample size that I felt comfortable to uh, share it publicly. But she did take the very first uh, uh, development of corn and looking at kernel count and that type of stuff it was such a marked difference between the low pressure and the high pressure side that uh, without a big enough sample size that I felt comfortable with I just wasn't going to show it it was that dramatic of a difference so uh, I'm excited to see ultimately at the end of the year when we get to final harvest what the numbers pan out but uh, it, it's on track for the system to basically pay for itself year one for a thousand acre farm is, is, is roughly what we're looking at right now. The farmer sent these pictures to me. Uh, he couldn't believe this. He goes, you know, I never would have thought in a million years that the wings, because the wings are still the original bias ply tires at the higher you know, 80 PSI, wherever they're at, they were rutting way worse than the center tires, right? And on the center fill planter, that's, it's never that way. So he just was so blown away by that. Now he owns the other four tires when this thing finally ends up in the shed this winter. Uh, for servicing, they'll, they'll change the last four tires out. Everything will be set at field pressure uh, for those wing tires. That way we get, he gets uh, rid of this rutting then next season when he's planning. And I thought this was kind of cool. This was from this tractor. Ken did this one day when he was out at the farm and I wasn't able to get out there. But you start looking at what does the footprint look like right in the field, right? Uh, Brian from Firestone showed some really cool pictures that they had done, computer simulation. This is the real deal. Uh, that's a really fancy way to do it. We just throw a little flower around the tire, and uh, but it's a great visual representation of, you know, what does the footprint look like? And you guys can see that's that's the difference that it makes. And that is what I got. They told me I only had 20 minutes today, or I could have gone for about two more hours easily. But you guys might have shot me. For that, I'll turn it over. Thank you very much.